Welcome to this week's Hagley History Hangout. At the Hagley Museum and Library, we document the unfolding history of American business and technology and their impact on the world. My name is Linda Gross, and I'm a reference librarian at Hagley. Through this series, we will draw on Hagley's extensive research collections to tell you surprising stories about our past. My talk today will explore a World's Fair that took place in Philadelphia in 1876. The 1876 Centennial Exhibition celebrated the 100th anniversary of American independence. The celebration looked backward to commemorate the progress made over 100 years, and it proudly announced that American innovation and invention were on par with the rest of the world. Over 9 million people attended the fair, an event that set the tone for the long series of world's fairs yet to come. Over 9 million people attended this spectacle. Hagley has long collected materials related to world's fairs as they provide a great window into the latest and best inventions of the time. In 2003, Hagley was able to purchase a collection from the 1876 fair, including two very large photo albums and three large scrapbooks of trade, ca trade cards, along with many guidebooks and related publications. I will share some of these images with you in this presentation today. May 10th, 2020 marks the 144th anniversary of the opening day of the Centennial International Exhibition of 1876. The official name of the fair was the International Exhibition of Arts, Manufactures and Products of the Soil and Mine. Held in Philadelphia, the 1876 Centennial Exhibition celebrated the 100th anniversary of American independence. The first World's Fair was held in 1851 in London's Hyde Park. The great exhibition of the works of the industry of all nations was conceived by Prince Albert and designer and educator Henry Cole as a celebration of modern industrial technology and design. All the exhibits were shown in one building, the Crystal Palace, an engineering marvel constructed from glass and a cast iron frame. The fair was a great success. It netted a profit and hosted more than 6 million people, about a third of the entire population of Britain at the time. The United States tried to copy the success of the Great Exhibition by creating its own Crystal Palace. The Exhibition of the Industry of All Nations was the first World's Fair held in the United States. The fair opened in 1853 in, a, in what is now Bryant Park. New York City. The general superintendent of the fair was Admiral Samuel Francis DuPont, son of Victor DuPont, a nephew of E.I. DuPont, the founder of the Gunpowder Company. The New York Crystal Palace was the largest building in the Western Hemisphere at the time. It was shaped like a Greek cross with four galleries of equal length and featured a large dome 100 feet in diameter. Considered an example of American innovation, Builders welded prefabricated pieces and installed 15,000 enameled glass panes. The exhibition was a place to showcase the new industrial achievements of the nation and received over a million visitors before it closed on November 1st, 1854. The building housed 4,000 exhibitors who displayed the industrial wares, consumer goods, and artifacts of the nation. Elisha Otis demonstrated an elevator equipped with a device called a safety, which would kick in if the hoisting rope broke. The New York Crystal Palace was destroyed by fire four years after it opened. I'm sorry, four years after it closed, it was destroyed by fire. The idea of a national exposition to celebrate the 100th anniversary of the Declaration of Independence came to John L. Campbell, a professor of mathematics, natural history, and astronomy. At Wabash College in Indiana. In December 1866, 
He suggested to the mayor of Philadelphia that the United States centennial be celebrated with an exposition in Philadelphia. The Philadelphia City Council, the Board of Managers of the Franklin Institute, and the Pennsylvania General Assembly asked Congress to authorize the fair, which would illustrate in their words, unparalleled advancement in science and art and all the variants, various appliances of human ingenuity for the refinement and comfort of man. A bill was passed in 1871 approving the idea, stating that an exhibition should be held under the auspices of the United States, at the same time leaving it to the people to raise the necessary money and therefore by volunteer, voluntary contributions. In early 1872, Congress created a Centennial Commission, including one representative from each state and territory in the United States. A Centennial Board of Finance was authorized to conduct a public sale of up to $10 million in stock. Once settled on the themes of patriotism, American industrial prowess, and the unification of the United States, the Commission and the Board of Finance had some success in selling the stock. By the summer of 1873, the arrangements had progressed enough for President Grant to issue a proclamation declaring that the exhibition would be held in 1876 and which invited foreign nations to participate. The financial panic of 1873 dried up the private financing. Fair organizers devoted the next several years to attracting attention and money from national, state, and foreign governments, from organizations like churches and universities, and from industrial and commercial associations. They enlisted newspapers all over the country in the cause. For example, in Delaware, the Firemen's Centennial Association was formed in January 16, 1876, by delegates of the different fire companies in Wilmington. They raised funds for a building to represent the state during the centennial. The Delaware building was described as a neat and attractive cottage erected during the months of April and May at a cost of $2,364. Members of the Women's Centennial Committee had the most success raising funds. Led by Elizabeth Gillespie, a great granddaughter of Benjamin Franklin, the members of the committee went door to door in 31 states, selling stock and bringing in $100,000 in contributions. Still, with insufficient capital on hand as the opening neared, and as the prestige of the United States was at stake, the federal government was forced to step in and contribute. Congress finally appropriated $1.5 million on February, in February of 1876 to cover the remaining costs, stipulating that the government was to be repaid. In the end, the total cost for the exhibition amounted to almost $6.725 million. At the same time as the New York Fair, the Great Industrial Exhibition was being held in Dublin, Ireland. Paris hosted exhibitions in 1855 and 1867, and the Great London Exposition of 1862 was in the middle. The Centennial Commission sent representatives to London, Paris, and the Vienna World Exhibition of 1873, and they noted the problems of these fairs. Visitors of the Vienna exhibition experienced inadequate housing and transportation, resulting in an outbreak of cholera, which caused many fairgoers to stay away. The commission members vowed to address the issues of health, comfort, and transportation at the Philadelphia Fair. The Centennial Committee of Plans and Architecture originally called for a single building to cover 25 acres, similar to the Crystal Palace. And in 1873, a design contest was announced. The winning proposal of the Philadelphia firm of Collins and Autenwright was the most elaborate. You can see here that they designed the Litt Brothers building in Philadelphia. It included the largest dome. And when the commissioners found that the winning design would cost at least $10 million to build, they decided to abandon the original plan of one large structure in favor of a variety of smaller buildings. The commission decided to rely on architects already employed by the commission or who were available nearby. The Centennial Committee hired 27-year-old German-born Hermann J. Schwartzman, employed by the City of Philadelphia as a leading engineer and architect for Fairmont Park, to design the layout of the exhibition grounds. In the end, there were five main buildings and 250 additional structures on 285 acres of land. 
Schwartzman designed 34 of those buildings. Schwartzman supervised the two-year transformation of Fairmount Park to host the exhibition. Over 500,000 cubic yards of earth had been moved, five and a half miles of double track were built, eight miles of gas pipe laid, and 16 bridges were erected. A water system separate from the municipal works was constructed, including nine miles of water piping, 16 fountains, a drainage system with a waterworks that could pump 6 million gallons daily. Three separate telegraph systems with underground cables were installed. The landscaping included 100, 153 acres, flower beds and lawns, and the planting of over, over 20,000 trees and shrubs. Joseph M. Wilson and Henry Pettit, engineers of the Pennsylvania Railroad, were hired to design the main building, the largest building of the fair, and reputedly the largest structure in the world at the time. The wood and iron structure covered a remarkable 21.47 acres and resembled a railway shed with a series of parallel structures with four 75-foot towers at the corners and four 90-foot high arcaded pavilions. They made extensive use of glass and designed louvers along the upper walls to provide lighting and fresh air. The main building housed the three international categories of exhibits dealing with mining and metallurgy, manufacturing, and education and science. Exhibits were arranged following a geocentric approach with American interests and manufacturers naturally taking center stage. Foreign exhibits were arranged from the center based on the geographic proxim proximity to the United States with China and Japan at the extreme. Across the aisle from the center of the United States exhibits in the main building was the Brazilian exhibit designed by Philadelphia architect Frank Furness. Many foreign governments had sent exhibits including costumes, industrial products, and minerals. Germany sent some large art artillery pieces made by Krupp. France sent $17,000 worth of vases from Limoges, and Mexico sent a two-ton iron meteorite. The Japanese allocated $600,000 and a commission of 25 people, the most sent by any foreign nation. The Japanese displays of pottery, bronzes, porcelain, lacquerwares, furniture, silks, Carvings, toys, and other wares were extremely impressive and won them 142 awards. The central placement of the United States in the main exhibition building brought a sense of pride to many Americans. Visitor Gilbert Hartley recorded his impressions of the exhibits by noting that the United States had by far the largest display of any country exhibiting. He was impressed by every conceivable article on display, including American textiles historic relics, china, lace, cutlery, foodstuffs, and furniture. In booth 188, a 29-year-old man from Newark, from Newark, New Jersey, named Thomas Edison, was creating quite a stir with demonstration of several original devices, including an electric pen and his quad, quadruplex telegraph. In booth 211, E.I. DuPont de Nemour had an exhibit of powder canisters and saltpeter. Between 1802 and 1890, black powder was the sole product manufactured at DuPont. The company won an award at the centennial and was commended for a handsome exhibit of samples representing various granulations of gunpowder and for fine specimens of refined saltpeter. Wilson and Pettit also designed the Machinery Hall, the second largest building at the fair, covering 14 acres of exhibits. Built of wood and glass on a foundation of masonry, it was a real improvement over previous fairs with crowded exhibition spaces and stuffy aisles. Eight entrances and louver, louver ven ventilators along the avenues and aisles allowed air to circulate to allay discomfort created from all the glass. Machinery Hall displayed the latest technologi technological developments in mining, chemistry, printing, power generation, weaving, and sewing, 
railway, aerial, water, and pneumatic transportation, and the working of metal, wood, and stone. Perhaps the most awe-inspiring element of Machinery Hall was the Corliss engine. During the early discussions of the construction of Machinery Hall, the Rhode Island Centennial Commissioner, George H. Corliss, volunteered to manufacture a steam engine that would be capable of powering all of the machines in the hall. The Corliss duplex engine was, dis was designed and built at his Providence factory in 10 months. The project cost $200,000, but it was provided to the Centennial at no charge by Mr. Corliss. The completed engine weighed 700 tons and was shipped to Philadelphia in 65 railroad cars. The massive piece stood over 40 feet high in the center of Machinery Hall on a platform 56 feet across. Two cylinders spun a flywheel 30 feet in diameter and weighing 56 tons to produce 1,400 horsepower. On the first day of the exposition, thousands gathered to watch as President Ulysses Grant and Emperor Don Pedro II of Brazil each pulled a lever to start a lever to start the engine. The engine powered hundreds of machines in Machinery Hall, performing tasks from combining wool and spinning cotton, printing newspapers and wallpaper, sewing cloth and making shoes, to sawing logs and pumping water. Near the Corliss engine in Machinery Hall was a long line of the newest U.S. locomotive engines, including those exhibited by Baldwin Locomotive Works of Philadelphia. Further down the hall, an object which created much attention was a 15 and 3 quarter inch diameter slice of the cable produced by John A. Roebling Sons and Company to be using the construction of the Brooklyn Bridge. The typewriter was introduced to the public at the Centennial. E. Remington and Sons based their Model 1 typewriter on sewing machine construction. It printed only capital letters and it used a foot treadle for a carriage return. And like a sewing machine, it sat on a table and was painted black with floral de decorations. For 50 cents, fairgoers fair could have a letter typed on a machine to send to a friend. Here's a letter that came from the exhibit. And the last line says, this written by typewriter, please keep. So you can see it was important. The United States of America commanded two thirds of the, of the 1,900 exhibitors in Machinery Hall. The second largest exhibit was by the British Empire, assembled under a large white and red banner announcing Great Britain and Ireland. With the exception of Brazil and Canada, all the other exhibits hailed from Europe. The Wallace Fa Farmer Dynamo powered a system of arc lights at the Centennial, which later inspired Thomas Edison to work on an improved incandescent, incandescent light. Alexander Graham Bell demonstrated his prototype of the modern telephone, the telephonic telegraphic receiver. The German munitions manufacturer Frederick Krupp featured an exhibit of guns and missiles. The most prominent feature of the exhibit was a monster cannon measuring two and 25 and a half feet long. The gun and carriage weighed 81 tons. The hydraulic exhibit called the cataract was a system of pumps that created a spectacular water fountain and demonstrated the use of hydraulic power. The waterworks not only supplied energy to nearby exhibits, but offered cool relief to visitors during the hot summer months. As a young child, Pierre S. DuPont was one of the visitors astounded by the huge display of water pumps at the Centennial. He later created Five Acre Fountain Garden for the enjoyment and delight of his guests at Longwood Gardens. The Hagley Museum collection includes a goblet apparently obtained by P.S. DuPont when he visited the Centennial. The handwritten note on the back reads, made at 1876 Machinery Hall, Centennial International Exposition, Philadelphia. Agricultural Hall was designed by James Windrum, the architect behind Philadelphia's Masonic Temple and Girard College. The building represented, resembled um, barn-like structures pieced together. 
It was constructed of wood and glass and consisted of a long nave with three transepts shaped like truss arches. At Agricultural Hall, the latest inventions of food production, processing, and preservation were being shown, along with American-made plows, cultivators, threshers, reapers, and mowers. Many of these implements were powered by portable steam engines. Annexes to Agricultural Hall displayed agriculture machinery, wagons, and carriages that could not fit into the main part of the Agricultural ex Exhibition Building. In connection with Agricultural Hall, extensive stockyards at Belmont Avenue displayed horses, sheep, swine, poultry, and other farm animals. Herman Schwartzman designed Horticultural Hall in the Moorish style of architecture. It was built of iron and glass on a brick and marble foundation in the style of the Crystal Palace of London. Horticultural Hall was the smallest of the five main buildings at 383 feet long and 193 um, and 69 feet tall. It contained the world's largest conservatory at the time, displaying thousands of beautiful and exotic flowers and plants from around the world. The cost of the construction came to $300,000. Eastern and Western ends included vestibules, restaurants, and reception rooms. An ornamental staircase at the western end led to, a, led to a gallery 20 feet high that surrounded the interior perimeter of the building. Exhibits included ornamental trees, shrubs, and flowers, hothouses, cons conservancies, garden tools, accessories of garden and garden design, construction, and management. A large marble fountain by Margaret Foley was positioned at the center of the hall. It apparently can still be found at the Horticultural Center in Fairmount Park. Memorial Hall and the Art Annex were also designed by Herman Schwartzman. Memorial Hall covered, covered 1.5 acres. Unlike most of the other buildings, it was built of granite as a permanent structure. The Bose Arts Building covered 1.5 acres, as I said, and was erected by the City of Philadelphia and the State of Pennsylvania for $1.5 million. A 23-foot statue of Columbia, the po poetic symbol of the United States, was placed at the top of the building holding a laurel, laurel branch. At the four corners of the dome were statues erected symbolizing industry, commerce, agriculture, and mining. Visitors entered the building by a rotunda devoted to statuary with two large galleries and several smaller ones on either side. The United States and Great Britain occupied the main galleries on one side with France and Germany on the other side. The displays included sculpture, painting, engraving, and lithography, photography, industrial and architectural design, and ceramic decorations and mosaics. Aside from the five main buildings, the Guide for Visitors map shows 180 different buildings, each color coded to indicate which buildings were constructed by the United States in red, the Centennial Commission, blue, foreign governments, white, restaurants, yellow, and all other buildings in green. Surrounding the massive exhibit halls were 24 modest temporary buildings constructed by various states. The state pavilions functioned as clubhouses where visitors from each state could meet and socialize, as well as view exhibits related to that state. Each state has a designated state day at the centennial. The state day celebrations drew the largest crowds. Pennsylvania Day, for example, drew the most visitors in one day, 274,919 on September 28th. On October 19th, Delaware and Maryland Day at the Centennial drew 1,007, I'm sorry, 176,407 people. The celebration included a jousting match with knights in medieval costume. Because what represents Delaware and Maryland better than that? 11 foreign countries also constructed their own buildings, including Great Britain, France, Germany, Spain, Portugal, Sweden, Canada, Brazil, 
Japan, Chile, and Tunis. The United States government building divided floor space among the War Department, the Navy Department, the Interior Department, the Treasury Department, the Post Office Department, the Agricultural Department, and finally, the Smithsonian Department. The Smithsonian Institution assembled a remarkable display of American wildlife and mineral resources. A 15-foot walrus, a polar bear, and other mammals were displayed along with the weapons used to hunt them. Sharks, a stingray, and other exotic fish appeared in preserve form, while fresh commercial fish were displayed in gigantic refrigerated display cases. The Smithsonian also worked with the Department of the Interior to create an exhibit featuring the clothing, tools, and works of art from a number of Native American tribes. Over 300 Native Americans from 53 tribes were brought to the fair, and they camped on the Centennial Fairgrounds. The Women's Pavilion was the first of its kind in a, at an international ex exposition. The pavilion, also designed by Hermann Schwartzman, covered 30,000 square feet. The construction costs of $30,000 were raised entirely by the Women's Committee. It offered a wide array of interests and in work by women, such as art, education, engineering, religion, and fashion. The women's building featured machines designed to economize household labor. All of the machines exhibited in the building were designed by women and run at the fair by women under the direction of a woman engineer, Miss Emma Allison of Grimsby, Ontario. Many visitors experienced Japanese culture for the first time at the centennial. The government of Japan provided a lavish display in the main building and erected two traditional Japanese buildings for a cost of over $600,000. 7,000 packages were sent to Philadelphia along with the carpenters and workmen needed to reassemble the buildings on the exhibition grounds. The Japanese dwelling, also called the Japanese government building, served as a temporary home for the Japanese workmen. The construction of the Japanese buildings became quite an attraction. A fence was constructed around the site so that workers could labor without interruption. The carriage, index in, the carriage annex featured a historical parade of wheeled vehicles from primitive to the latest Pullman, Pullman Palace cars. Finally, restaurants and other public comfort buildings corporate pavilions, and administration buildings filled out the grounds. Fairmount Park is situated two and a half miles northwest of downtown Philadelphia. Philadelphia was ready for visitors with direct railroad connections, able to service, the, um, service passenger trains every half hour, trolley lines, carriage routes, and even steamboats up the Schuylkill River. The Pennsylvania Railroad and the Reading Railroad constructed, constructed rail tracks from downtown Philadelphia to the site of the exhibit, and each had a centennial depot, Pennsylvania Railroad at the main entrance on Elm Street, and the Reading Railroad adjacent to Memorial Hall. The Pennsylvania Railroad increased its line of passenger cars to handle the additional traffic, and yet they often resorted to freight cars when demand outpaced availability. Two principal steamship lines service Philadelphia and European ports, the American Steamship Company with weekly sailings and the International Steamship Company or Red Star Line traveling every two weeks. Cook, Son and Jenkins, the American branch of the English fir firm Thomas Cook and Son, also offered a tourist ticket that allowed a visitor to book their transport and lodging in advance, pay for the trip in, the own, in their own currency and to plan the journey in innumerable com combinations. This startling novelty proved to be an innovative package that continues to inform the travel industry today. The Centennial Lodging House Agency worked in conjunction with the rail lines to aid visitors in finding accommodations. The company had 10,000 rooms at its immediate disposal in hotels, boarding houses, and private homes. There were at least eight hotels next to the grounds and over 51 in central Philadelphia. Most charged from $250 to $5 per day. 
Despite the prices and the muddiness of the not quite finished fairgrounds, 76,000 people showed up on May 10th in front of Memorial Hall to witness the opening ceremonies. President Grant and his wife Julia were joined in the grandstand by Emperor Dom Pedro II of Brazil and Empress Teresa, the first monarchs ever to visit the United States. The orchestra and chorus, located on an opposite platform in front of the main exhibition building, played 16 national anthems, followed by the centennial inauguration march, a specially commissioned piece by Richard Wagner. The Liberty Bell rang for half an hour. Admission to the centennial was 50 cents. A guidebook cost 25 cents. A glass of wa soda water, 10 cents. A one-way train trip from Philadelphia was also 10 cents. The average daily salary of an American worker in 1861 was $1.21. For most Americans working six days a week, 10 hours a day with no paid vacation, a visit to the centennial would have been a special event. A visitor would have to walk more than 22 miles, the equivalent of a three-day stroll, to see all 30,864 exhibitors from 35 countries. Rolling chairs could be hired for 60 cents an hour or 450 a day with an attendant or a dollar for three hours without an attendant. Concessionaires who paid up to 50% of their take for the privilege of doing business within the fair operated stands selling cigars, soda water, and popcorn. Visitors could also find new foods such as bananas and Heinz ketchup. Nine theme restaurants were available to fair goers, including French, American, Turkish, and Viennese. The exhibition was closed on Sundays, the result of Sabbatarian pressure, including George Corliss. But as a result of other pressures, alcoholic beverages were sold on the grounds. Soft drinks, including Heyer's Root Beer, cost three cents, or a free drink of water could be obtained at the fountain provided by the Catholic Total Abstinence Union, which still stands in West Fairmount Park. Another memorable attraction of the fair was the 30-foot right arm and torch of the Statue of Liberty. Visitors could pay 30 cents to climb inside the statue on, to the torch deck, which helped finance its completion and erection in New York Harbor in 1886. The Centennial Board of Commissioners awarded the sole license for photography at the exhibition to Edwin, Edward L. Wilson, editor of the journal, The Philadelphia Photographer, and his friend William Notman. The process for these silver albumin prints was complex and cumbersome. It required lots of supplies, equipment, and manpower. However, the process captured images in great, deal in great detail on the negative plates. The exposure time for the treated glass plate negatives averaged 20 minutes. Exposure times as long as two hours were reported, made necessary by the lack of good lighting in many of the centennial buildings. A team of photographers made 2,800 negatives. A crew of people printed and cut, mounted the immersion, the images on buff covered, colored cars, buff colored cards, which salespeople sold in a room lined with pigeonholes filled with prints. It was a 24 seven operation as the prints were trimmed through the night. The Centennial Photographic Co Company catalog lists 2,820 photographs for sale to the public, many in more than one size. Stereo views were sold for 25 cents each and the largest print sold for $5. On September 27, 1876, near the end of the Centennial Exhibition, the verdicts of the International Panel of Judges were announced at a ceremony held at the Judges' Pavilion. Breaking normal international exhibition procedure, no distinction was made between awards. Each medal awarded by the commission was bronze and measured three inches in diameter. The stamps were engraved by Henry Mitchell of Boston, 
and the medals were struck at the United States Mint in Philadelphia. In the center of the medal is a, fe is a female figure representing America seated on an elevation and holding a crown of laurels over the emblems of industry that lie at her feet. On the four corners of the medal, there are four other female figures representing America, Europe, Asia, and Africa. In this William Sellers and Company trade catalog from 1877, you can see how the awards from the other fairs were graded, with the gold medal being the highest honor and three medals from the centennial um, are, all being, are all the same. Not having the graded awards was an unpopular decision which was not repeated at the next international exhibition held in Paris. Here's another page from the William Sellers Company trade catalog showing the product shafting couplings and hangers that won an award for well-established excellence in workmanship and design. And here's a trade catalog from 1925, almost 50 years after the fair, still using the award from the Centennial as promotional tool to prove the quality of the product. The fair closed on November 10th, 1876. Over 9 million people attended this amazing consumer spectacle. In 1899, the US Treasury showed that the Centennial had a direct positive effect in increasing exports from the United States. Prior to 1876, the balance of trade had favored imports. After the centennial, the tide turned in favor of this country. The main building was slated to be raised, but the International Exhibition Company, led by Clement Biddle, worked to create a permanent exhibition in Fairmount Park. A huge crowd packed the main building to hear Ruther, Ruth, Rutherford B. Hayes open the permanent international exhibition on May 10, 1877. But by 1881, the IEC had lost money and they demolished the hall. Horticultural Hall was originally intended to be permanent. It had central heat and good lighting system, and it remained as a botanical conservatory for many years. Eventually, it fell into disrepair and had to be demolished in 1955 after damage by Hurricane Hazel. Memorial Hall is the only major structure remaining from the centennial. It reopened in 1877 as the Pennsylvania Museum and School of Industrial Arts. In 1928, the school moved to Benjamin Franklin Parkway as the Muse Philadelphia Museum of Art, although Memorial Hall continued to house art. Memorial Hall is the only major structure remaining from the centennial. It reopened um, Fairmont Park took over this building in 1958, and in 2005, after an extensive three-year restoration was conducted at Memorial Hall by the Please Touch Children's Museum, it opened to the public in um, 2008. The museum houses a scale model of the 1876 centennial. It was built in the late 1880s by John Baird, a member of the Centennial Board of Finance, and constructed by local mechanics who carved and painted the buildings and other objects. Baird donated the model to the city of Philadelphia. It was displayed in City Hall from 1890 to 1894. In 1901, it was put in storage in the basement of Memorial Hall. The other building left at the Centennial site was Ohio House, built of stone and sent from various Ohio quarries. The building underwent extensive restoration and opened to the public in November 20 of, um, 2007 for adaptive reuse as a cafe, event space, and offices. Several of the other smaller buildings were moved to other locations and reused for other purposes. The catalog and newspaper office was occupied by the Centennial Catalog Company and the newspaper advertising agents, SM Pedden. Pettingill and Company. After the centennial, the building was purchased by the Pennsylvania Railroad and moved to Wayne, west of Philadelphia, where it became a, rail, a railroad station. The building was later moved to Stratford on the same line. The station was recently renovated and is still in use. Some of the other state buildings were apparently moved to Belmar, New Jersey and converted into hotels. 
Machinery Hall was broken up into smaller sections and redesigned as other structures, including the Atlantic Hotel, which was renovated several times before it burned to the ground in 1972. The Kansas and Col Colorado State Building became the Colorado Hotel. The Delaware State Building became the Delaware Hotel on the northwest corner of 13th and Ocean. It was later called the Marlboro Hall. The Corliss Centennial engine was first dismantled and taken back to Providence, Rhode Island. Then it was purchased by the Pullman Company in Chicago in 1880 for its new car works. Dismantled in 1910 when Pullman switched to electricity, it was stored for pieces for a while and then sold as scrap at $8 a ton. A lot of the exhibits from the United States government building and items from various foreign countries that were donated to the United States were packed in 60 freight cars and sent to Washington, D.C. This large gift prompted Congress to allocate funds for a national museum, another lasting legacy from the centennial. The United States National Museum opened to the public in October 1881. By the 1890s, the museum's collections had already outgrown the new building, and a new U.S. National Museum building, now known as the National Museum of Natural History, opened in 1910 across the National Hall. The old building was renamed the Arts and Industries Building. For the next 50 years, it showcased the American history and history of science and technology collections. The building was closed from 1974 to 1976 for renovation and reopened with an exhibit called 1876, a Centennial Exhibition, which displayed many of the original objects from the Philadelphia Fair. The original Graham and Wallace Farmer electrical dynamos from the Centennial were exhibited and were still operational. The Smithsonian closed the Arts and Industries Building in 2014, but it reopened in the fall of 2015 as a special events venue. Finally, 100 pieces from the Smithsonian Institute's 1876 Centennial Exhibition are on loan to the National Museum of Industrial History set in the iconic Bethlehem Steel Complex in Bethlehem, PA. The museum opened in the summer of 2016 and features exhibits of machinery from the centennial, the iron and steel industry, as well as the textile industry, and highlights the industrial innovations across the nations. You might be interested to know what the first artifact installed in the new, ex in the new exhibit space was. Any guesses? A Corliss engine. This 115 ton steam engine was built in 1914 and pumped 8 million gallons of water per day for the entire city of York, PA. This engine, and as well as some of the original artifacts from the centennial, will serve as a reminder of the lasting effects of a fair from 144 years ago. If you are interested in seeing more images from our collection, you might be interested in exploring this book published in 2005 by Arcadia Press. The book can be ordered online from arcadiapublishing.com or other online booksellers like Amazon. Also, a number of images can be found in Hagley's digital archives at digital.hagley.org. If you click on the list of all digital collections, you will find the Centennial Exhibition, Photograph, and Ephemera Collection, and you can see some of the items from your home. Thank you for listening to this edition of the Hagley History Hangout. We release a new episode weekly. You can find us on YouTube, Facebook, and on Hagley's own resource page, hagley.org slash from home. Thanks. See you next time.